I walk into my company, I'm enjoying the daylights out of my company. Love the people I work with. And I walk in, and uh, I got fired. I got terminated. Now, the interesting thing about that, I never had any performance issues in my career, ever. And I still love that company to this day. I can tell you the company, Booz Allen Hamilton. Awesome consulting firm. If you could ever work for Booz Allen, they will, I will tell you, they have the resources that no one else has. Phenomenal. Unfortunately, I got fired because I wasn't the right fit for my boss. He wasn't a bad guy. I wasn't a bad person. We just couldn't work together very well. So he did what he felt was appropriate. He terminated my employment. It wasn't necessarily unexpected in the sense that I wasn't having conversations with him, but the day and the way he did it caught me completely off guard. So I had to answer the question now. What do you do? I'm unemployed. I had a father that was sick at the time. What I didn't realize was that was the beginning of a two-year downward spiral of his health, but by getting fired, it actually enabled me to go spend time with my dad. So it was a blessing in disguise that also allowed me to launch out CTS, which has been a huge blessing. But I had to figure out, what do I do? Tonight you're here, and you walk up and you meet people. And I walk up to Nancy. What's the first question we typically ask people when we meet somebody? What do you do? Well, after you, how are you? <laughs> okay, second question. How are you? And then, so tell me, Nancy, what do you do? Very same question. But you have a very different answer depending upon the circumstance of that question. What do you do for a living? And now it's an opportunity. Versus some of you have had the experience of adversity and now what do you do? Well, here's some strategies to kind of help you think about how to deal with that. So that regardless of which situation this question is asked, you can minimize the impact when you do have to have some adversity in your life. And also, like Craig and I, when we first started talking and I asked him what did he do when he came in, he has an opportunity to fuse a relationship perhaps that will last beyond just this one evening. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to do the opportunistic side of what do you do. So I'm going to ask you to get up and go find a partner that you don't know. Somebody in this room, I want you to get up physically and go find somebody that you know, don't know and get a partner and stay in there for a second. Go. Find somebody new. Here's your assignment is you're going to answer that question. I'm going to give each of you 60 seconds. You have 60 seconds to do your elevator pitch. What is it that you do? So, let's, I'm going to demonstrate it with Craig and Paul. So Craig is going to be the first person to go and say, you know, Paul asks him, what do you do? You have, not yet. Okay. So he has 60 seconds to answer. Paul, well, actually listen to him. Okay? <laughs> Harder than you might think. Okay? When, you get, when he gets done, okay, you're done, your 60 seconds is done. I'll tell you when it's up. Then you'll have the opportunity, Paul, to tell him what you do. 60 seconds. Okay? That's all we're going to do is tell each other what we do. Go. 60 seconds, first person, go. Well, let me ask you first question. Why do you think I had to do this? Okay, so one, yes. Can you do it? Why else? A little practice, certainly. Yeah. Okay, you critique. Critique. A little bit of that. Are you prepared on the spot? Are you prepared on the spot? You never know when opportunity is going to present itself, right? How many of you think of yourself as a brand? Like Coke, Pepsi? Some of you get this. You know exactly where I'm going with it. Sales people get it. They know. You don't necessarily sell a product, you sell yourself first, right? So, if you don't have a brand and a message that markets your brand and you can't articulate that, when you walk up and you ask, I ask Tracy, right? Tracy, I'm sorry for cold hands here. Um, what do you do if Tracy rambles on? Well, you know, I'm. How interesting is that? Right? Ask me what do I do? What do you do? What do I do? You know what I do? You ever been ticked off at work, Tracy? Yeah? I help, you know what I do? I help people stay ticked on. You know what happens when you stay ticked on? You innovate. You get work done. Things go faster, cheaper, quicker. Your boss is happy, everybody's happy when you ticked on. What happens when you ticked off? You innovate a different one, right? Away from the organization. 
Yeah. What happens when you take off at work? Uh, slow down. You slow down, right? Paul, what happens when you take off at work? Check out. Check out. You stop doing what you need to be doing. Get other people to take off with me. And you get other people to take off with me. Bring the party with me. I'll share my people. Right. So that's what I do. I help people stay ticked on at work. I have not helped managers do that. Keep their employees ticked on and help you figure out how to stay ticked on with your manager and also help you stay ticked on with your peers. That's what I do. One no more. I'll tell you more later. But, so here's what I want you to do. I want you all to just briefly look at what does a good elevator speech look like? The three components. First, identify what's unique about what you do. If you just said I'm a training director, how unique is that? Not. Okay. And was there a hook? If there's no hook in what you do in your 60 seconds, then you're just average, like everybody else. You don't stand out. Salespeople get this. And Although we still do, we still spend more time with teachers and not them. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. The other thing, so the hook makes it memorable. You may not remember anything, but you'll remember two things about me tonight. My last name is Love, so you might remember me as Dr. Love, and you'll also remember that I keep the tip on at work. Make it sound exciting and prompt someone to ask questions. Because what did I do with Tracy? I started out by asking a question. That's right. I engaged her. Exactly. If you didn't start out by asking a question, you also now have an opportunity to remain average and unremarkable in your elevator speech. And then, when you ask the question, now you create that two-way dialogue. And then finally, keep it simple. Don't ramble on about what you do. I really don't think most people want to pay attention to someone who rambles on for more than about a minute and a half about what they do because they're anxious to tell the other person what they do, right? That active listening thing goes down. So you have to kind of pay in a, in a, in a it's almost like, and that's why I ask about Twitter, you almost have to market yourself using Twitter-like language. 140 characters or about 60 seconds. That's what you got to make a difference. Make it memorable, use a hook. Keep it simple. So, quickly, I'm going to give you a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. Just give each other feedback. How well did you do in terms of your elevator speech with each other? Meaning these three criteria. Talk, go. <laughs> so you got some feedback. Are there some things that maybe you can tweak now to get your elevator speech a little bit closer to a little bit more effective? Yes, absolutely. So that's task number one, is when you go home, you have an opportunity to apply what you learned and try to start practicing the elevator speech. Make it effective. That's step number one in career management, because if you don't have a message, it ain't going to be hurt. 